As we continue on in our series looking at the book of Ephesians, I know we've been uh, kind of off of that for a couple of weeks now, but we're jumping back in. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5 here today. And we've been talking about how the, the book of Ephesians, it, it really, it started off not as a book, but actually as a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. And the Apostle Paul, he wrote this letter around 60, 62 AD, and, and he's writing it from, he's writing it from house arrest. And if, if I'm the Apostle Paul, I'm frustrated with God while I'm writing this letter. Because, because if you know anything about Paul, his life looked really different just a few years prior to this letter. A few years prior, he was the one who was in charge of, of persecuting Christians. He was standing by his, as Christians were murdered right in front of him, and he approved of it. And then he has this, this radical transformation, and, and all of a sudden he becomes a Christian. He becomes a follower of Jesus. And then from that point on, he's, he's known for planting most of the early church. He wrote most of the New Testament, and he's writing these letters from prison. And so if I'm Paul, I'm frustrated. I'm like, God, you, like, I wasn't in prison when I was murdering people, but now here I am. I'm, I'm fulfilling the Great Commission. I'm fulfilling what you've called me to do, which is plant churches and to preach the gospel. And now, <laughs> now I'm in prison. But Paul, he's, he doesn't wrestle with God. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt his faith. He doesn't view it as a setback, but actually a set up. It's like, all right, God, you're going to use this opportunity, and I'm going to be able to preach to people that I wouldn't have been able to preach to any other way. And so he actually uses that opportunity. He speaks to even some of Caesar's family, and he sees that they're saved. He takes this time, and he doesn't just write a letter to the church at Ephesus, but he, he also wrote the book of Philemon. He wrote Colossians. He wrote Philippians and Ephesians all while under house arrest. And the the heart of this letter to the church at Ephesus is is really, hey, as, as followers of Jesus, like as Christians, this is how we are to, this is how we're to live our lives in the church and in the community, in our family, all of it. And so he's, he's really, kind of talking to Christians in this letter. And and we'll kind of unpack that a little bit more as we go on with the message. And so while this letter is written to the Ephesian church, written to the Ephesian church, it's also written for us here today. Because the Bible doesn't just speak to what happened, but it speaks to what always happens. And so as we look at the church at Ephesus, and we look at its background, and we look at the culture really in which this church is planted, we see that there was sexual immorality, that there was idolatry, and really as we dig into it, we start to see, man, there's a lot of parallels to where this church was and where the Western church that we are in here today, like where we're at almost 2,000 years later. There's a lot of parallels, and so there's, there's a lot of truths that we've been pulling out of this letter and applying to our lives. And so today, as we look at the fifth chapter in the book of Ephesians, I want to talk to us today about guardrails. You see, it was, uh, I think it was 2017, my wife Rachel and I, we went on our favorite vacation we've ever been on. We went to Yellowstone National Park for our five-year anniversary and we had an amazing time. Like up until, up until this point in my life, I had never been west of, I think, like Indiana. And so everything was just new and amazing and just breathtaking scenery and mountains and the vastness of God's creation. Equally as breathtaking were some of the drives that we went on through some of those back mountain roads. And there was one trip in particular that I will never forget. 
You see, we decided that we were going to take a day trip down to the Grand Tetons. If you, if you don't know, uh, Yellowstone is actually kind of connected to another park called the Grand Tetons through the kind of like the southern part of Yellowstone National Park. Well, it was mid-May, and there was still a ton of snow on the ground, so that part of the park was actually closed. So we decided we were going to drive out around the park through Idaho, down through Wyoming, to to go to the, the Grand Tetons. So as we're driving along, everything's awesome. Everything's fantastic. We're having a good time, listening to music, talking, and just kind of just sharing life together. And just, again, in all of God's beautiful creation. Until we started climbing higher and higher. Like the elevation, like we're just, we're just going up the side of this mountain. And it's all fun and games until we started to realize that like, all right, there's like less and less trees up here and more and more snow. And the more snow there was, the whiter my knuckles got on that steering wheel. And then we started to see signs that we don't have here in Pennsylvania. I started to see signs like warning avalanche, like be careful, avalanche is like in this area. And I'm like, where in the world are we going? And I want to get off of this mountain 20 minutes ago. And so I'm white knuckling it. There's, there's a picture behind me that you'll see. It's, this is the view from, from the top of that mountain. And it looks beautiful. At least that's what the picture that Rachel took. It looked beautiful. I was focused on the road. And I was making sure that I did not get off that road because we were on the side of a mountain and it was a steep cliff off of the other side. And so I was like, hey, I'm sure it looks great over there, but I'm going to focus on where we're going. And, and even when I saw that picture that, that Rachel took, I'm like, look at that little tiny guardrail that's like right in the corner. You can barely even see it because it's covered in a snow drift. I'm like, what in the world is that thing supposed to do? Like, how is that supposed to keep me on this road if there's an avalanche? And so, so anyway, we, we keep going and, and eventually my blood pressure comes down and so we start, you know, going down the other side of the mountain. But one thing that, that I recognized, one thing that I realized that although I was, I was a rookie driver on those mountains, one thing that we all had in common, whether, they've, whether people have gone over that mountain many times or it was their first time, one thing that all of the drivers on that mountain had in common that day is we were thankful for that guardrail that was there. Because if it weren't there, there was a steep cliff on the other side that we would have experienced the exciting feeling of free fall and then heaven, like the, if that guardrail wasn't there. And so we were all thankful for that guardrail. Although the, the beauty on the other side, like nobody was saying, man, I wish that guardrail wasn't there. How uncaring, how unloving that somebody would put that there and block my view of just this beautiful mountain range. Like nobody was talking like that. And yet a lot of times that's how we view the Bible. We say, man, like God, there's, there's so much in this life that, that I could experience but you've put up these guardrails for me in your word and you're, you're just keeping me from that freedom. You're keeping me from being able to experience all that's out there. But the Bible, it's, it's more of a guardrail that recognizes that there's a steep cliff off the other side and it's there for our protection from imminent danger. You see, the chapter 5 of, of the book of Ephesians, it gives us a few guardrails to live our lives by. Guardrails that, that God put in place so that way we don't have to experience the chaos that waits on the other side. Not because God wants to stifle our freedom, but because he wants to protect us from that free fall that's waiting on the other side of that cliff. So let's jump in. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1, it starts off by saying this. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So before the Apostle Paul gives us the guardrails, he's actually giving us the destination in which we are to go as followers of Jesus. He's saying, here's, here's your goal, here's your mission, here's your destination as a Christian. You should imitate God. Live a life of love, 
follow the example of Jesus Christ, the one who loved you so much that he was willing to give up his life so that way you could have yours. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it, but because of his love for you, he was willing to sacrificially give of his life so that way you could have yours. That is the destination. That's where we need to be able to move towards as Christians, loving and caring, living a life of love. And so with that as our our destination, Paul continues on to give us a few guardrails of how we can get to where we're going. He continues on in verse 3. It says this. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ. Or I'm sorry, the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things these people do, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of the light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Let me boil all those verses into one category, and it's our first guardrail, that we imitate God in purity. You see, a reoccurring theme that we see throughout scriptures is that God creates and Satan counterfeits. God, he creates in a way that we can have freedom and joy and an abundant life, but Satan counterfeits, promising all of the same things, but delivering something much different. You see, the view at the top of the mountain, it might look great, but if you travel off the side and past the guardrail, you will reap the consequences. Sin is simply a cheap counterfeit that might look great from the outside, but its true nature is quickly revealed. When I was in college, I, like most most other college students, was broke. I was making $10 an hour, working 10 hours a week, paying over $20,000 in tuition. Like, that math does not add up very good. Like, there wasn't much discretionary income in that time. But I, I loved playing basketball. And so when my old high school basketball shoes finally wore out in college, I was like, all right, I really want to go buy another pair of basketball shoes but I can't afford like Jordans or Nike or anything like that. And so I I went to the store and I found the cheapest pair of basketball shoes that I could find. It did not work as, spoiler alert. Um, And so so I went and I, I, I played the first game and I was like, oh man, it doesn't even feel like I took these things out of the box. Like they are so uncomfortable and I didn't realize how bad it was until I was, I was done playing and I took off those shoes and there's just blisters all over my feet. And I was like, oh my goodness, like they, they looked fine, but it wasn't until I actually tried them on and wore them and, and played basketball in them that I realized that they're just a cheap knockoff. Like they, they promised much, but delivered only pain. Welcome to sin. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 17, it tells us that stolen bread or sin, it tastes like honey at first, but turns to gravel in your mouth. It, it looked good. Like it was, it was tempting, but then it failed to fulfill its promise. Sexual immorality, impurity, greed, obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes, they all contaminate what God desires. It, it contaminates the purity on the inside of us. It's, it's simply a cheap knockoff of what God has for you. Those things, they may have been part of your past, but that doesn't mean that that has to be who you are moving forward. 
And I love the compare and contrast that Paul uses here when he talks about darkness and light. Because you were once filled with darkness. Like that's, that's what sin is. It's, it's a contaminant. It, it hides from the light. It, it thrives in secrecy. You were once filled with darkness, but that's who you were. That's the, the emphasis is on the past tense. That's who you, that's who you were. Again, this, this letter... It's written to the church at Ephesus. Like these are the people who are receiving this letter. They're, they're Christians. They're followers of Jesus. And so this, this, this promise, it isn't for everybody. It's for those who have made that personal, that personal decision to have a relationship with Jesus. You were a sinner. You were in need of a savior. But Jesus fulfilled that role for you. He paid the price for your sin. While we were still in darkness, he paid the price on that cross. And you don't have to walk in darkness anymore. Now you can have the light from the Lord. You can walk in purity. You can walk in victory today. Romans chapter 6, verses 6 to 7, it promises, that, uh, it promises us this. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We, know, we are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. You see, we've been talking about this in our, in our freedom course Wednesday evenings, both here and at... Um, at our center county location as well. We've been talking about how, how the power of the cross is available to us here today. Not just, I mean, yes, for salvation, which is amazing, but also to, to allow us not to be a slave to sin any longer, that we can break free from our past and walk into the future that God has for us. And see, Satan, he tries to keep us a slave, to a slave to sin. He tries to blindfold us and tell us that there's no way out. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 promises us that therefore anyone who is in Christ, if you have a relationship with Jesus, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. So don't continue to tie your identity to your struggle. That's your past, that's who you were. When you, when you identify with sin, you refuse to get free. If you continue to walk around and say, hi, my name is Jason and I'm addicted to drugs. Hi, my name is Jason, I'm addicted to porn. Hi, my name is Jason, I'm addicted to alcohol. First of all, please don't cut that clip and take it out of context. <laughs> it's gonna get me in a lot of trouble. But when we continue to identify with our sin, we're refusing to experience the freedom that Jesus purchased for us on that cross. I might have temptations, but when I sin, I choose to run to the love of Jesus Christ. I choose to live in the light of Jesus. I'm not defined by my sins. I'm not defined by my faults. I'm defined by the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. I'm choosing to imitate God in my purity. And oftentimes, this is where we stop the purity talk. It's like, all right, make sure your heart is right. Make sure your actions are good. Make sure, you know, that, that you are walking in alignment with God. And, and all of that is true. And all of that is right. But that's not where Paul ends it here in Ephesians chapter 5. I'm just going to go back and read uh, verses 10 to 14, which we already read. But I just want to read it again. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It's shameful to even talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Paul is encouraging this church in Ephesus, and he's encouraging us here today to wake up, to expose the darkness that is pervasive in our culture. Darkness, it thrives in secrecy. The enemy loves it when he can continue his plan unencumbered by the church. 
Why do we as a church, why do we continue to, to sound the alarm on the sexual immorality that is pervasive in our educational system from preschool all the way through college? Why do we continue to talk about the drag queen story hours that are taking place in our local libraries? Why do we continue to scoff at the lunacy in the world around us? Because if we don't, who will? If we don't protect our kids, who will? If we don't affect our culture for the better, who will? You see, who's going to carry out the mandate of the church to expose darkness in the world around us if we won't? The answer is nobody. The culture, the world, it just continues to get darker if the church doesn't shine the light. So as we imitate God in purity... Yes, we, we shine the light internally. And we say, Holy Spirit, have your way. Get rid of all the impurities, all the contamination that's on the inside of me. But then do we hide that light under a bushel? No. <laughs> we let that light shine in our communities, in our world, to expose the darkness and to, to shine the light of Jesus Christ in the world around us. So we imitate God in our purity. And then Ephesians 5, it continues on in verse 15. It says this, So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because this will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs amongst yourse- amongst, among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God, the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's setting up the next guardrail that we have, uh, that he's giving to the, the church at Ephesus, but also for us today. He's saying that we, if we want to imitate Christ, then we have to imitate his wisdom, How many of you have ever acted thoughtlessly? If you don't have your hand raised, look at your spouse. They'd love to list off about five things that you did this weekend, and I'll give you some examples. You see, we've all been there. We've all acted thoughtlessly. As I was preparing for this message, I was thinking about some of the times that I've acted thoughtlessly, and I was like, oh, I could share about the time where I I shot a BB gun at a tree, and it ricocheted back and hit me between the eyes. And looking back, pun intended, that was not my smartest move. I could, uh, I could talk about the time in high school where I was trying to impress a group of my friends, and I tried to jump an electric fence and made it halfway over the electric fence. Again, <laughs> painful consequences. But then there's also the time where I was growing up and I was, I was a good bit younger, and, uh, and I was riding my bike, and, and I had one of those, those fancy ramps for my bike. It has a piece of plywood and two cinder blocks. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. And so I was, I was riding my bike, and I was, I was ramping my bike off of this, this ramp, and, and my mom came out to do some laundry. She was hanging up some clothes on the clothesline. And, and as a good mama's boy, I wanted to be close to my mom and kind of show off in front of her. And so I, I moved my ramp over close to her. And then I, I proceeded to, to jump back on my bike. And as I'm riding away, my mom's yelling after me. She's like, no, 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 Jason, Jason, stop. I turn around and look back. And she's like, you, you can't put your ramp in front of the clothesline. You're going to decapitate yourself. And I was like, yeah, you know what, that's, a, that's good wisdom. I should probably have thought that one through a little bit more. Like, I'm glad that my mom had my back on that one. And see, we've all had those, those thoughtless moments in life. But what does thoughtless living look like? See, if you're, you're living a thoughtless life, your, your mantra is kind of like, ah, Whatever happens, happens. Que sera, sera. It will be what it will be. You get blown around by every wind that blows throughout culture and throughout society. You just kind of move around and drift around. Your greatest ability is your ability to come up with excuses as to why you're the victim and why everything happens against you and why you can't see past your own nose. Like that is thoughtless living. 
So don't get sucked into the vortex of taking the easy way out. You were created with a greater purpose than just living for yourself and chasing momentary pleasures. Just like our culture, the Ephesian culture appeared to be going to hell in a handbasket. Like they had sexual immorality, they had idolatry, all of this was going on. And Paul is saying in this letter, he's saying, listen, I get it. You might not feel like you can make a difference in culture, in society. You might feel like there's no difference that you can make. But that doesn't mean that you just, you just put it on cruise control and say, you know what, I know that my eternity is secure. I know that I have salvation. So I'm just gonna live out this life on the, on the easy path and just kind of make it through to my final destination, which is heaven. Paul is warning against that. He's saying, live as the wise, make the most of these evil days, combat darkness with light and fulfill the great commission that your father in heaven has given you. So how do, we, how do we counteract this thoughtless living? Again, Paul kind of acts as our Google Maps. He gives us what we have to do in order to get there. And first he tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He says, if you want to be able to live out your calling and your purpose, if you want to be able to make the most of these evil days and not just sit back and coast your way into eternity, you need to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if you try to do it all on your own strength, on your own wisdom, on your own understanding, you will fall. You won't make it. You need the Holy Spirit leading you and guiding you in life. He also tells us to, to worship God, to fill our hearts with his praise. When Paul is in prison with Silas, what does he do? He worships God. The thoughtless lifestyle, it sits in the corner of that prison cell, it mopes about, it cries, it complains, and waits until the day that you're released, and then you make sure that everybody knows through your podcast about how much of a victim that you are and how you're going to deconstruct your faith. That's what the thoughtless lifestyle says. But Paul says, no, 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 worship. Praise God, even in the midst of difficult days. And finally, he tells us to give thanks. Thanks. Because when we give thanks, we recognize God's lordship in our lives. That all of this is just a blessing from him. It builds our faith. It builds the faith of others. And it's hard to stay lazy and frustrated and fearful and dejected when you're giving thanks to God for all of his blessings. And then finally, as we continue on in Ephesians chapter 5, we see that Paul encourages us to, to imitate God through submission. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 to 33, it says this, And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is to lead, I'm sorry, for the husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we're the members of his body. As scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two, and the two are united into one. And this is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. As I was preparing for this message, like I've read through Ephesians 5 many times, but as I was kind of re-familiarizing myself with the, the totality of this, this chapter, I was reading through it and I got to this part 
And I read through it, and I kind of stopped, and I thought, and I was like, man, I wonder if Paul was ever officially diagnosed with ADD. Like, was that a thing back then? Because we went from, you know, living as light and darkness and purity and wisdom and not living as, as thoughtless people do. And now all of a sudden we're talking about the family unit and submission. And I'm like, where in the world did this come from? Like, Paul, like, what were you thinking? And then I had to check myself. It's like, all right, that thought's probably not from the Holy Spirit. And so, God, like, what are you speaking to us through your word here? And as I kind of put it in the, in the context and in the kind of the framework of, of what we're talking about here today, I, I recognized and I realized that this is simply another guardrail that Paul is giving us. He's like, hey, hey, if you want to step out of the chaos of the world around you and into the divine created order of God, you're going to have to have even order down to the family unit. There has to be an order. There has to be a process. There are roles within the family. And if you, if you don't believe me in this, look around us. We have, we have a fatherless epidemic that is plaguing our land. And I'm not just talking about the, the single mother. I'm talking about sometimes there are men physically in the house, but mentally, spiritually, emotionally, or relationally, they're not there. They're a million miles away. And so the mom is forced to play multiple roles that she was never created to play. Right. On the flip side of the coin, our culture is, is telling women that, you know what? Raising a family is restrictive. It's beneath you that, you know, you're, you'll be more fulfilled if you chase a career. Don't have the child that will hold you back. Maybe, maybe even abort the child. Stay single. You know, be a boss. You fill in the blank and show the world how strong you really are. That's simply toxic feminism at its finest. It's stepping out of the created order that God has for us. And if you're here today, and you're thinking, Jason, this is some misogynistic, like, ridiculous, like you're taking Bible out of context and you're just telling women to stay in the bedroom in the kitchen like you're wrong. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that God has created each and every one of us with a plan, a purpose, and, and he created us male and female, and he placed specific gifts, talents, and abilities on the inside of us. And ever since the Garden of Eden, Man and woman, we've been rebelling against his created order and it's promoted chaos in the world around us. You see, so many times we, we struggle with this word submission because we think of it more in the terms of like MMA and UFC and we think of it in a way where I'm just going to use brute force and strength to make you submit to what I want. But that's not at all what Paul's talking about here. Paul's saying we, we imitate God. We follow the example of Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus do? When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's, and he's praying in his final moments of his life, the Roman officers, they're, they're coming, they're on their way to arrest Jesus. And Jesus recognizes what's before him and he, and he recognizes that he's about to go to a cross, pay, uh, pay the price for our sins and, 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 and live out the most painful, excruciating moments of his life. And Jesus, he's praying to God the Father and he's saying, God, like, I don't want to do this. It's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. If there is another way, if there's another way, I, I, I want to go that route. But he ends his prayer with an act of submission to God. And he says, not my will be done, but your will be done. And he goes to that cross, not because he wanted to. The Bible says for the joy of the Lord, he endured the cross. The joy wasn't the cross. The joy was the relationship that you and I can have with him because of what he has done for us. That is submission. Submission is not a negative term. If you look at the prefix sub, it means to come underneath of the mission. That's exactly what Jesus did. He, he submitted to the mission that God the Father had for him. If you wanna, if you wanna choose order instead of chaos in your life, you would do well to follow the guardrail that Paul places here before us in Ephesians chapter five and live a life of submission. 
submission to his call, to his purpose, to his plan, to his role for your life. The purpose of a guardrail is not to keep you from freedom. It's not a tool that we hold over another person, but it's to keep us from falling off of that steep cliff on the other side, a cliff that our culture is rapidly falling down, I might add. As we continue to to blur the lines of God's created order, making believe that sex and roles are simply interchangeable and based off of feelings and experience and desire, God creates, Satan counterfeits, and far too often we fall for the counterfeit in life. We have to apply godly submission in our life. Would you stand with me? God is a good God. He desires his very best for each and every one of us. When, uh, when Rachel and I, when we were at the top of that mountain and looking down over the edge of that steep cliff into the vastness of God's creation, it was beautiful, but the freedom and the true beauty that we were able to experience is when we got to our final destination. And we were free to, to walk around, to roam around, to see everything that God had created in that area. You see, I want to encourage you here today. Don't sell yourself short. Don't get to the top of that mountain, look out at the beauty and say, I'm going to create my own shortcut to where I think I'm supposed to go and go through that guardrail because there is pain on the other side. God has given us his word God has given us these guardrails in our lives so we can live a free and a fulfilled life. And maybe there's some of you here today that you're experiencing chaos in your world. And some of that chaos actually comes from the fact that we've never actually submitted to God, never submitted to his plan, never submitted to his purpose. We've been trying to go through this life all on our own creating our own guardrails and trying to think like, all right, this is how I make it through life. So here today, I want to give you that opportunity to choose Jesus. To imitate God, to live a life filled with love, following the example of Jesus. The Bible says that that you were created with a purpose, for a purpose, with a plan, a purpose, and a destiny on the inside of you. That's how God created you. He cares for you. He loves you. But sin entered the world and created chaos. When, when God had created Satan counterfeits, so he's distracted, he's confused you with all sorts of cheap knockoffs along the way. That's where some of the chaos comes into play in our lives. But God didn't just leave us there in the chaos. He sent his, his only son, Jesus, to, to come to this earth to live a perfect, a sinless life. He gave us an example of how we're to live, but he didn't just give us an example. Then he went to the cross as the only perfect human to ever walk this earth. He went to the cross and he paid the price for our sins once and for all. And now the ball is back in your court. Are you going to choose to accept that free gift of salvation that Jesus purchased for you? I can't make that decision for you. Your parents can't make that decision for you. God only has children. He doesn't have grandchildren. You can't get into heaven because of your parents' relationship with God. And so today, I want to give you that opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, in just a minute, if that's you and you want to make that decision to follow Jesus, I'm going to simply ask that you raise your hand. It's not to embarrass you. It's not to call you out. It's to know who I'm praying with here today. If you're tuning in online, you can just simply write, that's me, in the comments section of the stream that you're watching. And one of our amazing hosts, they'd love to pray with you and connect with you. But for those here in the house, in just a moment, what we're going to do is all together as a church, we're going to pray this prayer together. But if you're here today and you're saying, God, I, I give up control. I'm done trying to figure this thing out on my own. And today I choose to surrender to you. 
come into my heart. Forgive me, I repent of my sins. I turn from my wicked ways. And, and Jesus, I, I, I choose you. I know that the cross is enough to pay the price for my sins. If that's you here today, I'm gonna to simply ask, would you, would you raise your hand? Okay, it's not to embarrass you. It's not to call you out, but to know who I'm praying with here today. If you're joining online, just simply write, that's me in the comments section. Here in the house, would you just raise your hand if you're making that decision today? Amen. Amen. Well, church, let's, let's all pray this prayer together as one. Well. you just repeat after me? Dear Jesus, today I choose to follow you. Forgive me of my past. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me and make me new. Today, I'm a child of God, forgiven and free in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Can we celebrate with those who made that decision here today? It's the greatest decision you could possibly make with your life. And it's just the first of many decisions and, and following Jesus and following the plan that he has for your life. And, and we'd love to come alongside of you as your church family and, and encourage you in your relationship with him. And so earlier on, uh, uh, Pastor Leah was up here. She was walking you through that connection card. If you made that decision to follow Jesus, we'd love to hear about it. Go ahead and check that box off. Uh, we're not gonna like spam your email or anything like that. We just wanna connect with you and help you in your relationship with him. And, and before we go here, I just wanna pray for, for each and every one of us. Maybe you are a follower of Jesus. And, and I just wanna, I wanna pray that we would live in a place that we're imitating specifically God's wisdom. That we'd be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we would worship Him and that we would give thanks. And as we do those things, that we would fulfill all that He has called us to, that we wouldn't be lax, that we wouldn't sit back in these evil days, but we would make the most of it. So if you're comfortable, would you just raise your hands to heaven and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for today. God, I thank you for this moment in time where we can open up your word, and God, that you're speaking to us. And Lord, I pray right now that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we can't do it on our own. We can't figure this life out on our own, but Heavenly Father, we need you. And we're so thankful for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now fill us up to a place of overflowing where we're making a difference in the world around us. Empower us, embolden us to do what you have called us to do. And God, I pray that we would consistently have a heart of worship, that we would be singing your praise, that we would recognize your Lordship in our lives. And God, I pray that we'd have a, a heart and an attitude of thanksgiving as well. Lord, that it isn't just a holiday that we celebrate one day out of the year, but it is a lifestyle that we live, recognizing that everything is a blessing from you. And Lord, I pray that as we go from this place, that we would be a church that is on fire, set apart for you, for your purposes. And God, I thank you and I praise you for the work that you're doing here today. We pray it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said.